G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Good, Bad and Ugly for round 23 of this AFL season. Plenty of crazy games across the span of the weekend and of course, quite a bit of controversy. So we'll unpack all the games and get straight into it. Feel free to leave a like and subscribe if you do go on to enjoy and let's begin. So the first game on Friday night, we did witness the Brisbane Lions do a number on the Pies by four goals. It was a sensational victory by the Lions. This was a massive game for both clubs heading into it. The Pies really need to bounce back and start winning a few games in a row heading into finals. But for Brisbane, this was a huge game to try and lock in their top two final spot. So they are sitting in second at the end of the round. But uh, yeah, for a minute one, you could just tell um, that they were arrived and they were ready to play this game uh, really well. Um, and I think the difference between both sides was just... The Lions are just more the, more of the classier team. I think throughout the whole night, um, their ability to win the ball was much better. They were clean around the footy, especially a lot of handball chains like the likes of Neil and Dunkley were very good in their stoppages. Just very clean when exiting out of the stoppage. Going inside 50, it felt like every time the ball went inside 50, it was resulting at goals. When the ball went to ground, the small forwards like Charlie Cameron, Lincoln McCarthy, Zach Bally, a few of those players got to work. Archie as well. Um, they were just uh, really peppering the pies in defence without Darcy Moore and of course the injuries and a few key outs of the Pies didn't help them. Uh, Murphy unfortunately going down. Um, yeah, just the massive absence, absence for the Pies was no Darcy Moore. The Lions were able to do the damage really well in their forward half. They defended quite well um, as well. The, the Pies had a few opportunities to get into the game. They had a little bit of dominance uh, for a few minutes or so throughout the game but for the most of the night, Brisbane just controlled this game uh, really well. They played on their terms. They controlled the tempo with moving the ball really well. Um, and in the in and under, in the trenches, I thought they were much cleaner. They were class above the pies on Friday night. Um, and yeah, just uh, very damaging as well um, off the turnover. It was probably Lockie Neal's best game in quite a while. As just stated before, his midfield craft was on show um, at a prime level. I thought his game was magnificent. Joey Dunner on Hipwood worked really well as that tandem uh, forward duo that they are. Uh, Kitty Coleman, I really liked his game. Some of his ball use was exquisite. Charlie Cameron was up and about. McCluggage was a goal assist can on Friday night. Um, yeah, they just had so many focal points. They're working so well collectively as a group of the Lions and uh, looking like a good chance to lock in that home qualifying final spot. As for the losers, there is a little bit of concern, I feel like, heading uh, in towards the Pies camp. I know that Craig McRae will definitely still have confidence that they can bounce back, but the last four games, they've dropped three, which is not ideal. I think the last 10 years, there has been no Premiers that has won the flag uh, with losing, uh, I think, two games or two or more games uh, after round 17. They've lost three games after round 17, so they're going to have to sort of break history um, in a way. Uh, but yeah, you know, the Premiership runway, usually Premiers just go on that winning streak prior to finals. They're not not showing that Collingwood. I still feel like they're a great chance to the flag and to, to bounce back, but it's most likely going to be they're going to face Melbourne that qualifying final and they're just looking really off pace at the moment. Um, I felt like the, the way they moved the ball wasn't too great. Um, they were pretty scrappy with how they moved it. They just didn't look like them full selves. Again, no Dugowie, no Bobby Hill, no Darcy Moore. Darcy Moore really hurt um, hurt them, but we'll just see what happens, I think, when those players do come back. But yeah, they were just utterly, bitterly disappointing on Friday night. Moving on now to the Saturday games. First one up, we saw the Tigers get it done over North Melbourne by 29 points. This game was a little bit in the balance, but Richmond were really able to run away with it um, in that second half and, yeah, managed to outscore North Melbourne in the end. And it was a great uh, game to watch, I felt, especially if you are a Tigers supporter with the Premiership Stars retiring of Trent Cochin and Jack Rewell. Rewell able to kick that goal, which was great to see. Unfortunately for Cochin, he had a few chances, but he had a few unselfish moments where he actually did pass it off. So, hey, that would have been a great moment to see if he did kick the goal. Of course, Jack Siebel's last game for North Melbourne as well. Um, so, yeah, a lot of, you know, they're in these sort of games near the end of the year. It's great to see a few players. Uh, get the chair off and um, you know all the attentions around them so that's awesome to see I felt Richmond would bounce back and win this game especially at the MCG um, and they sure did um, yeah really after half time they Put the foot down, I felt, in the clearance game. They really started to, to, to get that working. I um, mean, inside 50, they managed to hit their targets quite well. Another one of those games for North, though, where they, for a period or two, they play really well for maybe a half. And then, yeah, the, the things just, the winning cultures, they just lack to have. They seem to lack a little bit of that leadership, and they just can't play well for a full four quarters. But Nick Larkey is really filling his boots. He kicked another six goals. Taron Thomas, he's been in some fine form individually wise, kicking two goals, having 25 touches. Dustin Martin, he's been a huge influence for the Tigers this year. Kicked three goals in 31, sort of like that 2017 or 2018 stat line um, from what we did witness back in those days. Shane Bolton, 
Norton, is he a sneaky chance for the All-Australian squad? He's just kicking goals and having high touches for fun every game, it feels. Four goals and 25 disposals. And viewing this game as a neutral, I had to be said, I think overall this game was pretty scrappy. There was a lot of foot skills and foot errors and a lot of scrappy turnovers. But uh, yeah, Richmond with their style were just able to really um, put the foot down and kick a few of those important goals in a row, especially in that fourth quarter. Um, out, completely outscoring and keeping the Kangaroos goalless in the final term. So Richmond, hey, it doesn't really mean much um, in the complex of their season, but this is a big win for the history of their footy club. Um, cheering off Jack Rewell and Trey Cochin in great style. And of course, congratulations to Jack Zebel as well. Uh, but yeah, the Tigers too good of a north. Moving on now to the next match in the Blues. Come from the clouds and snatch a win over the Suns by four points. It's now two weeks in a row where they have won a game by under a kick. And you can't really fault them, to be honest. The self-belief is really growing in this group. They were down by as much as 40 points throughout halfway through the second term or really at quarter time. We felt, ah... This is probably the, the week where the Blues don't really turn up. They were awful in that first quarter. Credit to the Gold Coast. They came to play. Um, they were ferocious around the footy. They wanted it more. You know, Andrew Swallow was kicking goals for fun around the midfield. They were just tearing apart the Blues. Could barely get in their forward half. But yeah, after quarter time, the adjustments were made by the looks of it. And the beliefs started to build. And that's a credit to Carlton. You know, with this winning streak they're having, they're just finding so many avenues to win. Big wins, little wins. Uh, you know, very small and scrappy sort of wins. They've been able to do it all, really, these past two months. Um, and it's a massive credit to him. But yeah, that second half, they really did seem to... It felt like we were, they were really going to run away with it and put on a massive score. But the Suns were just always a little bit plucky um, in that second half. They were always able to respond when Carlton were able to kick a goal. I think it was pretty dead even in sort of the contested game from the second half onwards. It was just a scrappy game, really going end to end. Um, and then we saw a few final quarter goals from the likes of Chow and the um, towards a bit of a margin. Swallow kicking goals for fun. He had some great marks inside 50. But yeah, the Blues led by Charlie Kerno. I mean, this guy's an absolute natural in front of goal. He was kicking goals for fun. Swung back into the fence to take the game-saving mark. And he was just clearly the best player um, on the ground. He, he just It was crazy. He just pretty much single... It felt like he single-handedly carried uh, the Blues over the line. He was a huge influence. As the Suns were continuing to pelt in more inside 50s in that second half, it just felt like every time it was going down, down. Jacob Wiedering's throat. He's been in some fine form. He was an absolute rock back there for the Blues, and his rebound was very good. And just everywhere, he was in the drop zone, making the action uh, alongside the flanks. Blake Akers feel like he's uh, he had a great game as well. Nick Newman continues to rack up the football. Brody Kemp back there. I think him and Jacob Wiedering is making a fine partnership down back. Love his rebound ability and his athleticism. And overall, this was just a really great game of footy. The Suns will be disappointed to drop a game like that. I felt throughout times in this game, they were just the dominant side. They were very good in the midfield. Took Miller and Flanders uh, had a day out. But yeah, just a belief built with Carlton. They were able to really find that extra gear. Um, they moved the ball. They continued to move the ball with Dare. They were very good through the corridor. Um, and yeah, you know, Kerner was just kicking those goals. And with minus 13 inside 50s, they found a way to hold on by four points. Great game of footy. The Blues continue their winning streak. Now moving on to one of the most insipid games I've ever seen throughout this year, the Giants. 126 point winners over the Essendon Bombers. The Giants were ruthless right from minute one. It was just another careless effort really from Essendon. We've seen a little bit of that this year. They've played well and the effort's been strong, but yeah, for other games, they've just looked quite poor. And honestly, this was probably coming, probably not a big win like this, but the last two weeks, scrappy wins over 18th and 17th. So if they weren't gonna lift, Something like this was going to happen, and it sure did. Uh, defensively, they were shocking. Uh, Zerk Thatcher got absolutely torn apart in defence. Same with Laverde. Uh, Jesse Hogan was huge, kicking nine goals. I think he had just... I don't think he had uh, 200 super co coach points, but he almost did. Uh, but yeah, as a back six, the Dons just really couldn't do anything. They lacked competitiveness in the midfield. The Giants at home, they're a very good side and they moved the ball well. It was a high scoring club history as well, breaking that record 162 points previously. It was 160, but we all know the Giants. I love to take the game on. They moved the ball so well. It was a complete masterclass um, throughout all facets of the game, really. They worked well as a back six. Josh Fain, you know, Josh Kelly, few, Whitfield and Lockie Ash, they were rebounding really well. Same with Himmelberg. Uh, I mean, yeah, in their forward half. That's the thing. They missed out on 
Bedford um, and Daniels the previous week against Port Adelaide. So that really hurt them. A bit of their ticker um, when moving the ball in their forward half. A bit of their pressure gone. But with them back in, um, you know, they were awesome. The pressure was really elite. And just every time it was inside 50, it was resulting in a goal uh, for the Giants. Tom Green went off. Um, same with Cornelio. Briggs with another big game. Yeah, just a classy performance from the Giants, who are currently at the end of this round sitting in eighth position. So if the Bulldogs do lose, they will make finals. But if the Bulldogs win, they'll probably have to beat Carlton on Sunday afternoon. So yeah, their finals chances are still alive. A massive win over a poor, poor Essendon outfit. Now we move on to Saturday Night Footy. These were some season-defining games right here. The Saints ending the Geelong Cats season by 33 points. What a game of footy it was from the Saints. I was bullish on them heading into this week. I actually did tip them. Um, not a team, not a guy that really tips the Saints too much, given I don't really have much confidence in them. But I backed them in this week because I feel like the past few weeks they've really been playing good footy, or at least the showing up so with how they play. They love to take the game on. They're playing sort of that finals brand with the pressure um, and also the way they move the footy. The midfield's showing more competitive signs. have been great as a back six. I feel Wilkie's been great. Um, you know, Max King's been feeling his boots. Uh, the small forwards been getting to work. So I felt there would be every chance here to knock off Geelong. They play their best footy at Marvel. And look at that. They just do pretty much everything so well from what I did state. The main thing though, that pressure was just immense. Of course, as a Swans fan, I was watching the other game, but just the first few minutes from what I was able to watch with this game, every time the cuts got the ball, bang tackle, bang four stoppage, bang turnover. They were elite with the pressure and of course watching the replay just the goals I kicked were classy. You know, every time it was going in there, there was just dangerous options. Filippo, Butler, Higgins, they were all making an impact. Max King as well, kicking a few goals. Royal Marshall's year just continues to impress. Like, he's now turning into a true goal-kicking ruckman. The, um, you know, ability to move forward and maybe slot home a goal or two. Racking up the football as well. But yeah, King with three goals, Sharma with two, Higgins with two. Just so many focal points now they're finding uh, the Saints in their forward half. Uh, it was just remarkable uh, with how they did play. Really, really good in defense. You know, Wilkie was superb. They managed to keep Jeremy Cameron goalless and Tom Holkins only to six touches and two goals. So I think when you can really stop them and try and eliminate a bit of their run power and a bit of their ball use, uh, which the Saints really did well. They were able to really nullify and, um, yeah, restrict the Cats' movement. Yeah, the free kicks were a bit one side of the Saints' way, um, but they just owned it in so many areas. Like, they just pumped them around the footy. And this is the Saints' midfield when they're up and about. They can be a damaging group. Yes, it can be one pace, but, you know, Steel and Krauts were really up and about. Uh, plus 12 clearances in there, which is a, a great sign to see. Plus 24 contest possessions, which is um, a crazy number. And this is a bit of the thing uh, issue with the Cats as well. Their midfield on their back line... I just don't think it can compete. And there you go. Um, the writing's on the wall now. Just not good enough. They won't be playing finals in 2023, the Cats. But yeah, just a great win from the Saints. They've proved me wrong. I tipped the Saints for bottom four this year. Uh, but what Ross Lyon's been able to do and yeah, just make the most of their list. Uh, we, I, I've had their doubts in their second half of the year. But I backed them in this week. And there yeah, they, um, yeah, they've totally proved me wrong this year. So they'll be making finals, the Saints. A terrific game it was from them. Uh, you know, Cordy as well was great. Mason Wood, Mitch Owen. Yeah, they're just um, in some fine form, the Saints. They play in that finals brand. Terrific win over their bitter, bitter rivals of the Cats. And now we move into one of the most controversial games of this season. The Sydney Swans holding on by one point over the Adelaide Crows. I'll answer the question that everyone wants to know, and that's what's all been on social media all this weekend. Was it a goal? Yes. As a Swans fan, yes, it was. Very, very lucky, the Swans with the great escape. But as I do say, I don't like to talk about the umpires and the controversy too much as these videos, I just, I just like to talk about the match itself. And the reason why the Sydney Swans did win this game in the end was the damage was done in the first three quarters of football. The Swans were a class above Adelaide, especially in that first half. They were, um, they were up as, as much as 44 points, I think, around and towards the near end of the second quarter. But just from minute one, you could tell the Swans were, uh, were ready to play some tough footy. It was sort of wet conditions, rain throughout the game was spurting a little bit. Uh, but they were just... 
the, the, the main thing was they were cleaner and they were classier. And I felt um, that was the difference in that first half because they were able to put on a score going inside 50. They were a bit more cleaner. Uh, Adelaide, they had their chances, especially in that third term. But the Swans defended really well as a back six. And that's the thing, you know, when Sydney are able to break even in the contest in the clearance game, they're actually beating Adelaide in that. Throughout the first half, they can put on a score. And they've just been such an efficient side, Sydney. Their fourth half's been humming. And that's what we did witness again with this game with Heaney filling his boots. Probably a three-vote performance. I do say McLean with two goals. Papley with one. Wicks with one. Uh, you know, a few of their four and a half plays really humming. Um, and in the midfield, you know, Gordon with 30 touches. He was very good. Chad Warner, road bottom, was a tackling beast, of course. Uh, but the, it, it did really change um, in that second half. Adelaide were able to get a bit more of a grip on the game. Had a, li a lot more territory. But yeah, that third term... Uh, it, this one's pretty much broke even. Uh, well, both teams broke even on the scoring side of things. Sydney were very good off the turnover too. They rebounded really well. Nick Blake, he was superb. He was rebounding. He was intercept marking. Tom McCartan had a great game on the Texan. Limited his influence as much as he could. Uh, but yeah, that fourth term, that's just been the story of the Swans' season, really. Their fourth quarters have been terrible. 32 points they're up by at three-quarter time. Then Adelaide go on a rampage, kicking goals for fun. It felt like the inevitable choke was coming. And then that keys chance, which was a goal, which was fortunately, as Swans fans, a point. And yeah, Sydney were able to run it out um, and win the game. So yeah, if there's any Adelaide supporters, they've had it harsh this year. I felt their brand overall this year it was it, it's just been brilliant. Jeez, I've had some unfortunate losses. So I feel plenty of sympathy for them. It's a harsh way to lose and a harsh way for their season to end. Uh, but the damage was really done, um, I felt, in that first three quarters. The reason why the Swans did hold on. They only kicked one point, so I guess the handy point does help them throw that handy behind. Uh, but they were just, overall this game, the more tougher, the more cleaner, and the more composed side, and really made the Crows pay off the turnover. So yeah, the Swans do lock in a final spot in one of the most controversial games you will see. It should have been a goal. Probably the Crows should have won in the end, but the Bloods hold on and they'll be playing finals footy in September. But the crazy games do not end there as we move on to the Sunday ones now. The West Coast Eagles picking up one of the upsets, or in fact the upset of the season by seven points over the Western Bulldogs at Marvel Stadium. Was not expecting this result. I thought this would just be a write-off, easy tip. The Doggies get it done easily. But hey, you probably should have looked more into their past form. They were terrible, terrible against the Hawks last week. Their effort was poor. The way they went inside 50 was very bad as well. Um, the same can be said with this game. Going down by seven points against the last place side who I've lost so many 100 point plus losses this year. Um, it's just a despicable and uh, terrible performance from the Bulldogs. I said at the start of the year, as a bold call, I reckon Luke Beveridge will be sacked at the end of the year. Is that the case now? Terrible performance there. Finals chances are now in a bit of jeopardy, so they do have to beat the Cats if they do want to play finals football. Uh, but yeah, just similar to the Hawks loss last week. Their effort was poor. The way they went inside 50 was terrible as well. And such a weird viewing. They were a total shell of themselves. Seeing that midfield and that back line that can go up and about. They usually rebound well. You know, Hugo Hagen and Waitman, they were just ghosting. They just could not make an influence. Right from minute one, the Eagles won the first quarter. They went on a bit of a rampage. This is the thing with West Coast. I feel like the last few games at Marvel have been pretty good. They've actually been able to move the ball really well and hey, ended up winning the game, so they were remarkable. Of course, West Coast fans will be happy and sad. They played a great game. They finally won. Uh, well, they, continue, they found their third win of the season, but they probably now lose the race for Harley Reid, which is a little bit unfortunate. But the three votes, of course, maybe Bontempelli, but Jamie Cripps was an absolute star in this game, kicking five goals. Um, he's had his injury woes this year, but he's always been an underrated player. He can find the goals. He was a sharp shooter in front of goals. Tim Kelly's had a great year. Elliot Yo was just bursting out of stoppages and clearances all the time whenever he had the ball. McGovern went down, but he came back on. He was just everywhere in the drop zone. They defended um, a little bit scrappily, but McGovern was the big man. Jack Darling, a few of their young players really getting involved as well, which is a great scene, thing to see for the future. Noel Lung loved his attack on it. Uh, you know, Hewitt's going to be a gun, I do feel. Um, and yeah, they were just um, able to keep in the game. There were chances where the Bulldogs were looking like they were going to run away with it, but they just kept on responding. And it was just such a resilience building uh, victory from uh, the Eagles. So that changes the complexion of things so much now because a lot of people are saying Adam Simpson will be sacked. 
Probably not now after that win, but I just cannot believe that from the Bulldogs. They were just poor, like just getting done by the Eagles where you just can't have that. Only plus three inside 50s, losing the clearances. Like this is a side that usually are, do dam are dam very damaging with scores from stoppage. They haven't actually been able to show that this year. Might have won the contest possession count in the end, uh, but you know, they're just very weak um, around the footy. They defended really poorly. Um, and yeah, just a lot of easy goals they conceded, especially from kick-ins and all that whatnot. So the Eagles deserve the win. Um, some star performances and a crazy game for your Sunday afternoon. Next Sunday game, we did see the Melbourne Demons get it done over the Hawks by 27 points. From the performances of both sides, look, if you're a Hawthorn supporter, you're probably pretty proud. I reckon they just gave it a really red-hot crack. They ran out of steam, really, from that second half onwards. You could just tell with Melbourne, the more experienced, the more classy, the more seasoned side, um, they were able to really run over the top of the Hawks with a much more of a younger side. And, um, yeah, you know, there's, there's probably um, no hard feelings or anything uh, with that loss for the Hawks. Gave it a really good crack in that first half. They were down as much as six, six points um, with that early goal from Dylan Moore heading into the final turn. We thought, hey, could the Hawks do it? Get another upset win over a top four side. But yeah, it's just the class of the Demons are really uh, able to run away with it. And that's been quite good of them, Melbourne. They've, you know, a few fourth terms uh, the past few weeks. They've actually played some great footy. Um, and yeah, they just found that extra gear to kick away um, and to kick to a score with, uh, yeah, just keeping the Hawks to just the one goal and kicking three goals, three themselves. But yeah, for the first three quarters, this game was really in the balance. A number of lead changes throughout the match. The Hawks started really well, but the Demons were just always able to find that response and keep themselves in the game and get out to a bit of a buffer throughout stages of the game. For most of the game, I felt around the footy, the Hawks did really well in multiple areas, winning the clearances by nine and the contest possession count, winning it by uh, eight, in fact, which is um, always great numbers with a young midfield. How about the debut on of uh, Henry Hustle with John Newcomb out? He did come into the team and make his debut, kicking two goals. And I remember looking at a few of these guys' highlights prior um, to this year and um, his draft year. Looks like a very clean, sort of that tall midfielder. Had 15 touches, two goals. Really like the classiness of him. Connor McDonald, two goals and 19 touches. A few of their young players um, getting on the scoreboard having some nice stats. Uh, but yeah, inside 50, I felt in that fourth quarter, they were really able to pick out their, their targets well. Jake Melksham, Joel Smith, Jacob Van Rooyen, the multiple goal kickers uh, for the Demons. They picked out their targets really well um, when the moments really needed to, to started to matter um, in that fourth quarter. And they dominated in the inside 50s as well, which has been a positive with Melbourne. Um, they've had um, very good, they've been very good with getting um, the you know, high amount of inside 50s. Um, they'll just uh, very good with moving. I think they'll a bit better moving the footy you know, than the Hawks. And watching this game, this is one of Melbourne's wins where most of the work really relied on a lot of those role plays and I felt collectively as a group they played overall really well. It wasn't really just Petrarca and Oliver and Gorn. They didn't have their greatest games but we saw the likes of down back. I really love uh, Trent Rivers rebound off half back. He's had a fine underrated year. Chuck McVee is another one of those great finds from the Demons. I think he was a bit of a um, uh, low draft pick. He's just looked very reliable across the whole span of this year. Loved his game as well and of course Melksham and Chandler and a few of those forwards getting on the end of those goals. But overall as a new this was just, um, I think, a really good game of footy. Um, it was just an, an expected result, really. There were some great moments from a few Hawks players. Warp White, 11 clearances, Nash with eight. The young midfield impressed. Uh, without Mitch Lewis, it did hurt them, I felt, um, going inside 50 like Kajitski, uh, you know, was, a, was 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 battling hard, but you could just see the absence of Mitch Lewis. They were really hurting without them. Uh, Lever and May were really good in their back half. Um, they just couldn't break that defensive wall, Hawthorne, as the game wore on. They rebounded well. They got the inside. 50s. Uh, Petrarca grew as the game went on. They kicked those important goals to run away with it. And yeah, just a class year and more season side of the Demons getting it done by 27 points against the Hawks. And now for the final game of the round we did witness. Port Adelaide getting a much needed and important win to keep their top two hopes alive over the Plucky Fremantle Dockers and Gallant Dockers by 16 points. Uh, another one of those close losses Fremantle have had this year. So, hey, they're finishing out uh, the season quite respectable. Um, I felt their effort was quite good. But, yeah, they were just um, really outdone, I felt, um, in that midfield. But as Rosie, Jason, or Francis, I mean, this midfield trio is going to be a treat to watch um, in the years to come. They had a great game, I felt, um, as a trio in that midfield. They were very, very good. Um, and, yeah, they just they're put, pretty much put out. They were just able to keep... The Dockers at arm's length. It was a pretty cagey first half. 
goal for goals, really. A few in a row for Port Adelaide. Uh, Fremantle were able to respond back, and the game was a little bit in the balance. But yeah, after half time, Port Adelaide were able to get out to a bit of a buffer. Um, their clearance and around the footy um, did really start to improve. And inside 50, they were picking apart their targets really nicely. And uh, yeah, a number of individual players getting on the scoreboard. Burn Jones had some important goals. Always love the look of Pal Pepper, his ability just to burst into packs and just you know, grab it and just rush out and break a few tackles. Um, he was great. Finn Layson, uh, a few nice snapping girls with him as well. Really, really. Jed McIntyre, Ollie Lord, Horn Francis kicking the goal as well. Zach Butters, another great game from him. Wonder how he'll go in the Brownlow Medal. Um, but yeah, I think just around the footy, Port Adelaide were there a little bit of that, a little bit touch better. Um, it was another one of those games from Fremantle where they just wanted to try and play the games on their terms. Uh, you know, they had a lot of chip marks and all that whatnot with the likes of Luke Ryan and everything. They swan Braden Cox for late he was able to kick a great goal but yeah Fremantle were just not good enough um, that's just been the story of their season a bit of a shoulda woulda coulda been disappointing with some games just been inconsistent in general really they won the inside 50 count um, by six and yeah with the clearances Port Adelaide just that too good winning the clearances and the contest possessions and Port Adelaide were just, I felt, the more skillful side. Fremantle's ball skills were a little bit questionable. I felt like that probably cost them a game in some sort of aspect. And there was a few poor turnovers and Port Adelaide were able to make them pay on those mistakes. So in the end, Port Adelaide get it done by 16 points. Probably not the most convincing result in the end, but it's actually been quite a while since Port Adelaide have actually able to beat Fremantle in Perth. I think it's the first time since 2014 or somewhere I read. So yeah, they rarely do win in Perth. Um, and for, for that second half onwards, they'll just able to keep the Dockers at arm's length. And yeah, just a bit more of the skillful and classy side in the end. They were a lot more better uh, going inside 50 and more efficient. So yeah, big win for the power their top two hopes are still alive. So over on there was another episode of The Good, Bad and Ugly for rounds 23 of the 2023 AFL season. Again, another crazy round of football. There are some great games, controversy galore. Um, but yeah, season and the ladder is really now starting to take shape. Not really too many differences can be changed or made in the final round, really. Um, the final spot in the eight is up for grabs, either between the Western Bulldogs or the Giants. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much going to be a bit of a jumble to see who does make second and who does not. So yeah, still keen for the last round of footy. Feel free to leave your comments down below and let me know what you think um, or, or let me know what you thought of the round as there is plenty to discuss. And yeah, apart from that, fellas, feel free to leave a like and subscribe if you did go on to enjoy. And until next time, I'll talk to you later. See you later, fellas.